Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the um, vocabulary of weaving in Japuk um, and um, about historical linguistics and also some things related to uh, how um, the, the um, system of orientation is used to express um, the um, uh, the activity of weaving in this language. So, um, so some of this work, um, so some of the the things I'm going to talk today are partially mentioned in my in a grammar I published uh, uh, one years ago. So let me just put a link here yeah, in the chat. So, but uh, not. Uh, I'll add a few things that are not in there. And also it's based on um, a series of uh, videos I made in uh, 2014. And one of them is on available online with a transcription. So uh, you can uh, um, uh, click on the link and listen to it after the presentation so that you have an idea, a more precise idea of, of this. So I'm going to make this presentation also in um, for uh, my fellow um, colleagues who are doing language documentation in Gyalong areas and elsewhere um, to um, also in the hope that some of you will do similar research and find um, um, language teachers who are able to um, um, explain the activity of weaving. I think, um, that it's quite important, not just for the documentation of the language, but also to understand the larger um, cultural context of weaving in a society. And also it has incidence on um, the study of, uh, uh, I would say, interdisciplinary research, uh, combining linguistics on the one hand and other fields, in particular archeology span on the other hand. So I'm going to, um, talk about Garongic languages. So one Garongic language, Japu, which is um, here spoken. This is um, Barkham, spoken in the, the, it's a region in Sichuan. Most of you are already familiar, but some uh, who are present today may not know this area well. So it's a, uh, a Markham. Um, it's, it's a county in Western Sichuan. Garonic languages are represented on this map in uh, purple. Yeah, so he, m most of them are, are located in Western Sichuan here. Some of them are also in uh, Chando, so the, the Smarskat uh, language that were recently, well, discovered, uh, I mean, uh, recently um, uh, brought to the attention of linguists. And Pa uh, Liang, who is uh, among us today, is now doing field work on one of them. And uh, this one is Tongut, uh, language uh, attested, the oldest, uh, the ancient language in a subgroup, uh, a, a Tongut that is attested from the um, 11th century onwards. And uh, I think that uh, in a joint work by uh, Yunfan and, and myself and a few other colleagues, we, we showed, I think that uh, it really is a sub-branch of the Gyarongi subgroup. Now, today we've heard about Karsteng, so one of the variety of Sethu, and about Krosjap. So here we have um, areas where there's varieties of Krosjap are spoken. Um, and uh, Japuk is uh, the target language of, of this talk. Yeah. Now, in the uh, recording I sent you, uh, so this is Tzinzin, uh, my uh, language, main language teacher, presenting uh, how, explaining how she makes looms. She makes um, a colored belts. Uh, so it's called Hua uh, Tai in Chinese. Yeah? And um, so she uh, demonstrates how to make them using this loom. So it's a, a type of loom that's called um, body tension backstrap loom. Yeah? 
So it doesn't have a, a huge frame, uh, unlike um, more complex looms that you can, uh, you may have uh, seen uh, with uh, a complete frame in wood. Um, uh, here you just have the threads. Uh, so this, these threads, the uh, the the warp, the the threads that are uh, um, tied onto the back of the weaver on the one hand and tied to some other place on the other end. So actually they are tied uh, next to the window. Uh, she, she just improvised this, uh, this uh, weaving place in her, in her apartment. Um, what is interesting is that uh, this is an area of the vocabulary where we have particularly uh, detailed terminology some of which is um, of local origin and some of which is borrowed. Uh, that's something we are going to investigate. Yeah. But before I start, just let me discuss today's talk. So I'm going to present the local vocabulary in your book and other gardening variety and um, attempt to uh, identify the part of the vocabulary that's uh, native and that's the one that's borrowed from Tibetan. So that's quite important because, uh, though, so that's the kind of thing linguists can tell whether a word is inherited from a common ancestor of subgroup or whether it was borrowed from some other language, literal language, and whether it can be reconstructed and how old the word is within the language. So now, uh, this is important because if we want to reconstruct the history of the weaving technique, one way we can do it uh, is by studying the antiquity of uh, the word themselves uh, in the vocabulary uh, and compare it with the insight we can get from the uh, material uh, artifacts themselves and the techniques themselves. Yeah. And I think that there is much room for further research in this area. And finally, I'm going to discuss about, as I said, the orientation system. And I, okay. So, first of all, it's important to uh, point out that part of the weaving vocabulary in, ja in, ja in Japanese and other Garong languages is actually very ancient and uh, borrowed, uh, not, not borrowed, but inherited from proto Sino Tibetan, the common ancestor of Yarongik and Chinese. So we have, for instance, uh, the word to weave, and the word to spin. Uh, uh, so for instance, we know that this all origin for ang, and it just happens that um, it corresponds well to the equivalent words in Tibetan and in Chinese. Uh, so this, I'm not going to go too much into detail in, in terms of the sound correspondence, but they, there is a, a, a good fit in the sound correspondences of these words. Uh, in Japuk, we have verbs. Kata and Kapu are verbs. In Chinese, they are verbs too. Uh, in Tibetan, this, this is a verb and this is a, a noun, uh, spindle. But in any case, there is little doubt that uh, these words are inherited. So this is quite important. It means that Part of this vocabulary is much older than the Gyaronic languages themselves. So, um, how old? Yeah, well, um, there is uh, some, the earliest spindles discovered in, in China. So, we have the verb to spin. Uh, we, uh, the, the verb for loom and spindle are derived from uh, these verbs. So, here, the nouns are not so important. You know, we, we, it's, it's better to focus on the verbs themselves you know, because the, the nouns uh, for loom and, 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 uh, and spindle are derived. And actually the nouns across the family don't have good correspondences. They, they tend to be innovated in each subgroup, but the verbs are quite old. Now, um, this can be compared with uh, some of the material culture actually because um, so the spindles actually are uh, well preserved in the archaeological record. 
And um, so in former work with uh, Propose, uh, Yunfan and I have participated in it that um, the origin of the Sainte Tibetan family, there is evidence that it comes from the, um, uh, 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 the mid and uh, up Yellow River in uh, the early Neolithic, so around um, uh, 7,000 uh, years BP, so 5,000 years BC, um, corresponding to possibly these uh, uh, cultures. So this is the arch early archaeological evidence for uh, Neolithic cultures that have either a millet farming or rice farming. So millet farming culture are indicated in purple and mainly rice farming culture are indicated in yellow. Uh, a few cultures have both, like Holi, for instance, has little uh, rice. And the idea proposed in articles and also supported by a lot of scholars is that the origin of the uh, San Tibetan family uh, is probably to be looked for in the Yellow River Basin. Um, and um, what's interesting in regard with the weaving um, uh, techniques is that um, so in a Tsushan uh, culture and also a Pelikan, we have uh, traces of uh, spindles. Not only in these cultures, they are actually, uh, these, these are also found in uh, the culture of the uh, Yangtze River. Um, but um, uh, in any case, in a, in a Yellow River base, in the early Neolithic culture already had spindles and also possibly evidence of um, uh, shuttles yeah? so, uh, uh, made of bone. Yeah? So of course, textiles are poorly preserved in general. So we, we don't have a lot of ancient textiles dating from the early Neolithic in this era, part of the world. But um, um, I would say that the linguistic evidence and the archaeological evidence uh, have a, a good fit here. So we can't reconstruct a lot, but there is definitely evidence that um, the uh, so some of the um, weaving techniques that are found in uh, the Sino-Tibetan speaking areas may be uh, inheritance from um, uh, the, the from the early Neolithic, um, rather than, for instance, a borrowing from other parts of the world. Yeah. Although this is something that needs to be determined, but there is this potential. Uh, so there is also another route that's not found in Chinese, but found, uh, for instance, in Pulong, a word for weave baskets. So not really uh, weave clothes, but weave basket, baskets, which involves a slightly different process. But we use the same word in English, uh, although other languages may not. So for instance, in Chinese, we also have a different verb, in, as opposed to, uh, uh, to, to uh. Now, apart from these verbs, which are uh, much older than Yarongi, what exactly, uh, which kind of, of vocabulary do we have? Well, there is, um, of course, the important elements of the loom are the threads themselves, the warp and the weft. So, uh, uh, so qing xian and wei xian in Chinese. So um, the, the warp here are the colored threads, the ones that are um, um, tied between the weaver and the other end. Uh, there are several colors of, of, thread, of, of warp here. And the weft is this, uh, this uh, white thread uh, that is inserted between them. So here, uh, so here, what's interesting is that, um, so if we look at Tibetan Chinese, we see that, that the terms are completely unrelated. And actually, um, uh, they are not very specific in, China, in Tibetan Chinese. These words have many other meanings. If we compare now Japuk 
they love Koyash and Krostjab. Uh, we also see that there's no uh, clear correspondence between them. However, now if you compare the ancient language Tongut with Krostjab, um, the sound correspondences we observe here, which are not trivial, are actually quite correct. So uh, for the first word, this V can correspond to a P, the U can correspond to this vowel, and the dot under the U can correspond to the pre-initial L. For this verb, for this word, uh, it's the same. We, the, the E U can correspond to O, the pre-initial R can correspond to this, what's transcribed as an R in this, in this transcription. And the K, K can correspond to this K. It fits also with Conscience article about uvulas and velas in Tangut. Since here we have um, yod that is expected if we have a vila here rather than a uvula. So from the point of view of some correspondences, um, the, 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 these, uh, the, the cross cap and a Tangut form are uh, quite compatible. So here I have to specify that if you look at these characters, in, uh, Tongue dictionaries, um, you will, uh, uh, they, they, they don't gloss them as web, weft and wall. Uh, I think they, they, they give the same gloss for both of them. Uh, but that's probably because we don't have many textual examples of these characters and their exact meaning in the Tongue's text is not well known. And actually, uh, by comparison with Kroskia, uh, it's possible that we can recover the meaning of the Tongue word. So uh, this is something that needs to be confirmed by uh, more work on the tongue texts, but uh, I haven't uh, identified yet uh, examples of these words in texts other than the dictionaries. Yeah. So in the dictionaries, we know that they have to do with, uh, with uh, weaving, but uh, the exact meaning is not, uh, is ambiguous, I would say. But in any case, I think that we have uh, good evidence that these two terms are native in Krostia Pentangut and go back at least to the comma, their common ancestors so of proto West Yarongu. Um, in Japuk, we have another word, an interesting word, skarsh, which refers to this. The place where the weft and the warp crosses. So, um, actually, in English, uh, I learned from uh, Chris Buckler's work, this uh, a space between a warp and a weft uh, is called a shed. I'm not sure which term we could use in English for the crossing place. But in any case, uh, there is a special word for it in Japan. I'm not aware of uh, any special word in any other Gyaronic language, but I urge uh, my fellow field workers to uh, um, identify the words either for the space between this this space between the warp and the weft and uh, for the crossing uh, part between them. So these these pictures are taken from the video uh, uh, from which you can see the, the, the link of which I sent in the beginning of the other presentation. So, so these, these terms are definitely native. They are not borrowed, but uh, Jayapuk and Krostiap uh, don't have uh, cognate, cognate forms and uh, the further etymologies remain uh, unknown to me. But uh, hopefully uh, when uh, equivalent studies have been done on other varieties of Yarongi, we may have a better understanding of the history of these words. Now, but at, at this day, they are not derived, obviously derived from known verbs. Uh, so uh, they all may be potentially ancient. Now, apart from these, we have a lot of implements and some of them are of Tibetan origin. Yeah? So the English terminology here is based on uh, uh, the book by Gudo and Buckley on, uh, on uh, the roots of Asian weaving. 
uh, which is focused on uh, the weaving of, of Miao and uh, and Kadai speaking uh, uh, people mainly, not exclusively mainly, uh, but uh, provides a very detailed uh, lexicon of uh, term terminological equivalence between Chinese and Tibet uh, and um, and English, and uh, provide the terms in many uh, languages in uh, Mongik and. Uh, and Kradai languages. So it's a very useful book to do field work uh, also in Tibetan areas, although the kind of looms we have in Tibetic, in the Gyarongik areas may be very different. And what we see here is that, um, so there's a, I put the Gyarongik form instead of Tibetan here. Um, a lot of the terms we have here are actually um, Tibetan words. Yeah. So it's, quite clear for all these, yeah? And I'll show the implements uh, and uh, what they are like. The last ones, the, the ones, uh, the, so snas in Tibetan, ne, and snat uh, in Japuk, is probably not um, a borrowing, but rather a cognate, yeah? Because the, the forms do not uh, present the sound correspondences that we usually find in, in uh, loan words. And it refers to something that we'll see in pictures. It's useless for me to go through these terms now without the pictures. So first of all, let's have a look at this. So it's called chiz in Japan. This is the this rod element that's used uh, to that. Um, uh, so uh, in in a, in a um, video, if you have a look at the video later, you will see how it's used to uh, clamp. The, uh, the the one uh, end of the warp threads so as to uh, and then to um, um, tie it onto the waist of the weaver. Yeah. So it's used to maintain uh, the tension on the on the warp thread. Yeah. So uh, this choose the word. It looks like a Tibetan word, but I, I did I, I couldn't. I haven't yet identified which word, yeah? but uh, I suspect that um, this uh, z comes from a bu suffix preceded by an s. So, so um, I'm still looking for the word, and I hope I'll find it someday. But it's, it's certainly not a local uh, Gyarongik word. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, so we have this z fa fa final uh, element, for instance, z, so the result. Which is from Tibetan brass bu. So the sound from part of your sound correspondence is z is definitely from z bu. Uh, I think that uh, it's quite clear. So this is called cloth beam in English. Now another part of the loom is these these uh, small plank like things called tasha that are used to. Uh, um, they are moved up and down uh, and are used to select the different types of and keep separate the different types of, of, uh, of warp thread because we have several colors of warp threads that are used to make the patterns in a, in a cloth as it is, it is woven. Yeah. So as you see, the, the, the thread is woven first from the lower end. Yeah. Uh, from the waist of the weaver up, upwards. Yeah. So uh, we, you have a uh, woven thread uh, here and it's rolled on, uh, then on the cloth beam. So this tasha, uh, the ta element, uh, is actually the cognate of the verb we have here. This verb, weave. And Tibetan this ta form is another uh, uh, morphological alternative uh, alternate related to the verb root that we have over there. Yeah? And sha would mean something like uh, uh, flesh or, or meat, but I'm not too sure why we have this form here. Um, uh, but uh, this word, sha, 
is you can find it in the dictionary in Tibetan. The next uh, word that we can identify is uh, the word beta. So this this um, thing here, I don't know. Yeah, we, we can't see it, it well, but in the video you see it's a wooden wooden implement with a blade. It has a blade that um, um, has not been sharpened, of course, yeah? and it's used to beat the the weft. The, so this this uh, uh, white thread, so that it's um, uh, the 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 weft and the warp are tied together. Yeah. Before um, um, uh, and, and uh, so this this implement, as you can see, is called tamu, uh, and uh, more or less cognate with the, the, the Tibetan form. Takma, well, probably the the form from which tamu comes from is raza and takmu with the mu suffix in the, the ma suffix. It wouldn't be very surprising. Yeah. So, but in the dictionary, if you find takma, yeah. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if takmu would uh, appear in some text. But I just didn't identify it. At, 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 at. So all of these are uh, implements are um, are uh, Tibetan words. Uh, so um, actually, these were self-made. So Tsinzin's uh, 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 husband made this uh, for her. So they, it's locally made. And then we have this word zgril. Zgril refers to what? Refers to this rod. Yeah. That also used to control the degree of tension in the warp thread, yeah, at the other extremity from the weaver, yeah. And the small one here is called zgrub, the little zgrub, with a diminutive suffix. So, um, all of these um, are borrowed from Tibetan. So we see. Um, the actually the most of the implements used to make the 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 the, the class are Tibetan loanwords, as opposed to the verbs that are local and the names of the thread themselves that are also uh, uh, have uh, inherited words. And then we have the last term snas in Tibetan or ne if you pronounce it in Hausa, and snat. So this one refers to what? Refers to the head um, The These are these things, these, these threads with different colors. And they are connected with a stick. So, what's their use? Their use is to select one type of uh, the, the, the different. Uh, a type of, of, of warp thread that you are choosing. Uh, you pull them up and uh, you uh, select a different layer of, of warp threads. So the, the term in English is head for that. Surprisingly, this word is found else everywhere in San Tibetan. So it's quite old. Uh, we have cognates in Tongwood, in Tibetan, not just but in these, but also in Burmese. In Toulon and in Jingpo. So uh, actually, apart from Chinese, it's almost a proto scientific word. So that confirms the idea that um, some relatively elaborate kind of loom technology did exist very, very early in a mid or even early Neolithic. Uh, of course, uh, we wouldn't expect these to be well preserved archaeologically, but uh, the linguistic evidence is quite, uh, I think, quite clear. And I don't think these words are likely to have been borrowed uh, because the, the, the form do not match uh, what we would expect of borrowings from Burmese into Dulong and Jingpo. Uh, and it's also a word that's probably cognate in, in Tongwood, and it's a perfect cognate. This cognate actually was discovered by Gongxun a few years ago. Um, and, and here, the, again, 
the glass that's given in the dictionaries is quite misleading. Yeah, I, I think it's also given, it's also translated as, 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 as warp or weft uh, thread in the dictionary, but it's quite misleading. It's just because the dictionary makers didn't, uh, haven't looked into detail at, at, at the etymology of these words. And we haven't a text that attests their use. You know? So it's a case where uh, comparative linguistics can help to correctly identify the meaning of, of words in Congo too. So, so this is what I wanted to say about the etymology of, of uh, the weaving vocabulary. So as we can see, we can identify the etymology of most of these words apart from chizu, and we can also distinguish well what is inherited from what is borrowed. So what is borrowed is all has to do with the, the, the wooden implements that are used to make these, uh, uh, the, these tools that are used to make the additional patterns in the cloth. And um, uh, these words, uh, the, the history of these words uh, deserves to be better known. And I would be interested also to see if any Garonic language has non borrowed words to, de to designate these implements. That would also be something quite interesting. So some of you today are still on the field. I'm thinking of, in particular, of Cha Haoliang and also of uh, Yu Jing, who are uh, in, uh, respectively in um, Chando and in, um, in uh, Rnawa areas. And uh, so if you have time to find someone who can weave cloths and uh, show you how to do it and explain at the same time and you have the opportunity of making videos of it, I think it would be quite an important uh, contribution to a document uh, uh, how uh, uh, the weaving process takes place and which terms are used for each, each of, of, of these uh, uh, tools. Now, Another interesting thing from a really purely linguistic point of view, it's not just the etymology of the words themselves, but the grammar that goes with it. Now, we have an interesting metaphor in the, pro the weaving process. Um, well, the warp threads, the axis of the warp threads is, is um, compared to the upstream, downstream axis. Mm -hmm. Now we know that in Garoing languages, and Shuya is going to talk about this more detail tomorrow, we have a tri-dimensional uh, axis uh, system. So many of us have written about it. Uh, uh, Miyo Jing, who is present today, also uh, has an important article on this. Um, so one of the axes is upstream downstream another axis um, probably east west some have interpreted it as a mountain versus river axis um, so yo jing has written uh, about this particular issue and the third one is more straightforward up there and in fact all the three axes uh, have a uh, um, play a role in a description of the weaving process now, the most conspicuous axis is the upstream downstream axis. Downstream in this uh, 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 system represents the side where the, uh, of the weaver. Upstream is the side away from the weaver. Yeah? So here next to the window, where, where the, the other place where the um, uh, the warp threads have been um, uh, have been tied down. Yeah, so this is called alo in in Japan and ati loti. So let's see an example sentence taken from this uh, the 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 recording. You can uh, later uh, listen to. You have the whole transcription, sentence by sentence. So it should be easy to to find. Kitariki a pombo lukushiyeki ayarteki. The wolf, uh, this thread, uh, whose uh, body goes upstream, so actually is oriented towards 
uh, the opposite direction of the lever is called the wall. And I, here I use the color, this color code, uh, to indicate uh, the morpheme in the original that correspond to this upstream orientation. Now we have downstream. So here the color code, I use, uh, I use blue to indicate the upstream downstream axis. So this refers to the action here. Let me see. Uh, no, uh, another. Uh, oh yeah, I, I don't. I don't have it. Uh, I, I don't have a, a picture of this action. Pamu uh, So newlet here. So using the orientation westward means when you take this tamu, this. Um, well, wave beta. You put the wave beta between the wall threads. This is called newlet. Why? Because it is the orientation perpendicular to the upstream downstream axis. You see? So the left right of the weaver is compared to the east west orientation, regardless of where he actually is oriented himself. Or herself, you know. uh, regardless whether he it's uh, the the geographical orientation is uh, uh, north south or whatever, uh, the east west orientation will be used to express simply the axis that is perpendicular to the upstream downstream axis. Mm -hmm. yeah. So logically, you use newlet uh, to indicate this. Uh, uh, the, 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 the motion of the uh, wave beta between the threads and so perpendicular to the, um, to, to the, to the threads. And so the, it, it's um, basically the left-right orientation of the, uh, 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 of the weaver. Yeah? And then you have this expression, chuta. So that's quite interesting because the verb kata, uh, so this cognate of, of Chinese uh, found in the uh, uh, it, it can be used with two orientations. It can be used with the orientation upstream and your orientation downstream, and it has a different meaning in Japan. When it's used with downstream, it actually refers to the motion downwards when you take the wave beta and beat the weft tight. Yeah. Because the weft is taken and you move it towards yourself. Yeah. So the motion takes place downstream. It's also used with upstream, but then what's the meaning? When you say luta, it means that the cloth is progressively making being made and it goes up upwards on the opposite direction because as you pass uh, the weft and you beat it and uh, you, you create cloth it grows towards the opposite direction of the weaver so this is upstream so these are things that are difficult to convey precisely in a dictionary so here, chuta means to press down, weave down, if you wish, to express it literally. And when you create path by the weaving process, you weave up, upward, upstream. And then in the same passage, just bef before you see, ki So what it means is the tamu causes Sukshi is the causative of go, actually. Yeah? Causes the askash, so we said before, the space, the, the, the place where the weft and the warp crosses. We bring it down yeah? and press it. 
And here it says chisuki. So again, we have this meaning downstream to, to express the meaning that this intersection is moved toward the body of the woman. So this is the upstream, downstream axis. So in fact, in um, the Japu grammar, I already mentioned this phenomenon that we have an upstream downstream orientation uh, to to, corresponding to the, the direction of the warp. But in fact, we have uh, all four orientation units uh, when we describe the weaving process. The eastward westward orientation represents the orientation of weft. That goes uh, perpendicular to the wall. And up and down can be also used. So I, I haven't represented it because it would be difficult to see. So in blue, you have upstream, downstream. In red, you have eastward, westward. You have to understand it as perpendicular to the, to the upstream, downstream orientation. And then you have a fourth orientation that's also perpendicular to them although it would be slightly slanted here because the upstream downstream orientation is slanted here, it is the different layers of wall. Because since you have different colors, you have different layers uh, corresponding to, you have the, 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 the red wall and the green wall. Huh? And you have this, um, uh, you, you can use the up and down orientation to refer to these different layers. When you, for instance, you change color for a particular, uh, to, 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 to get a particular pattern. So this illustrates uh, one of the extended use of the, uh, the tridimensional tri system that is so uh, grammaticalized in a verbal system and in a whole uh, system, uh, grammatical system of Yarong languages. Now, one of the reasons I'm making this presentation that I hope to have that uh, fellow uh, linguists and field workers and uh, um, speakers will help in documenting this uh, aspect of the language and uh, answer the different questions. So is the upstream downstream the tri-dimensional tri, um, uh, system in other Yarnwick languages used in the same way to express the different aspects of weaving? And do we find cognate words other than the ones I've shown here? Do we find different words, native words perhaps, for these different implements? Or do we find different Tibetan law. What's the age of these different words? And what's the age also of this use of the tri-dimensional system? And these are all questions that I can't answer now, but uh, I hope that this presentation will motivate you to uh, do further research. So with this, I conclude and um, I hope that uh, it was interesting to you.